Well, hi everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into this very special installment of this series, uh, where we're going to explore our most recent experiences, perspectives, and observations on the real life deployments of data science, uh, the cloud, and everything analytics. Um, what we're seeing, the battles that we and our clients uh, are facing, the best strategies we've gathered along the way to get data into the hands of those who need it most. We have a lot to cover, so I'm going to get going. First and foremost, uh, I will introduce myself. My name is Chris, uh, and I uh, have the honor of being a part of our analytics and data science group at NewComp Analytics. Uh, NewComp, for those of you who haven't worked with us before, based here in Canada, uh, head office in Toronto. I'm actually in Calgary, where I want to I run our Western Canadian group. But Newcomb's been doing this a long time, 20 plus years before analytics and data were cool. Uh, we met Alteryx, uh, which is gonna be a big part of our talk today, uh, a couple of years ago, actually at a, at a Tableau conference down in Seattle. And as fate would have it, uh, you know, it's been an amazing journey since. We quickly rocketed to the top of the partner profiles, and here we are as a premier partner for a number of years in a row. Um, it's been amazing, and we're blessed to have Alteryx as a partner and pretty excited for the future. What does Newcomp look like as an organization? Um, we think about our practices as our DNA, and so you know we do everything uh, AI and machine learning, so this is where our, our teams of data scientists are using math and computer science and domain knowledge to deploy machine learning and AI uh, right into the hands of people working with data, people who need predictions and need real-time insights on things that are happening, recognizing patterns that humans can't see. Our data engineering group, which is tasked with getting all of that data together from wherever it lives, uh, whether it's on the web or buried in some system somewhere, streaming off of the internet um, and capturing all of that, putting it into containers where we can use it for analytics and data science, govern it properly. Uh, we've got our BI and visualization group. This is where, you know, the last mile of analytics where data gets into your hands, it's displayed in front of you. So you can see all of the things that are happening, recognize patterns, um, pivot things, you know, change it to, to suit your view. We've got our cloud practice in the bottom right hand corner. Cloud underpins everything these days. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit. Um, and then we've got a practice specifically for the, that closing the loop of plan. You know, when you run a report, you see a number, uh, you drill down to understand why that is happening. The last mile of that is reallocating resources, reforecasting and budgeting, uh, putting your money where it's needed most. And so we've got a practice dedicated to uh, the Office of Finance and Operational Planning. Let's talk about the cloud because it's such a big component uh, of everything that we do in the world of analytics. Um, you know, the world has changed. I'm going to try and merge two streams of thought here. One is how Alteryx fits into modern data architecture and two, why the cloud makes this so powerful. But to understand that, we've got to go back a little bit and understand how we got here in the first place. So if you look back to the 90s when BI really started, still, you know, reporting was still very much performed by specialists, but starting to become consumed by non-technical users. In the 2000s, we kind of moved to this self-serve world where all of that reporting function kind of decentralized a little bit. And so, you know, business users are running their own reports and uh, creating their own views. While this was going on, the world uh, was changing, as we all know, right? Data and technology uh, is at the core of everything we do. In the beginning of this, um, call it 10 to 15 years ago, the world was starting to generate data. In fact, so much data that you know the traditional ways of data warehousing uh, just couldn't handle it anymore. And so the natural evolution was for you know the Facebooks and Googles and Yahoos of the world to start uh, because they were having to deal with all this data that was being generated with their large and uh, storage and computing infrastructure. They started to take those uh, systems that they were building for themselves and saying, hmm, maybe we could commercialize this. We've got a way of retrieving a lot of data really, really quickly, compressing it and getting it into uh, somebody's hands in real time. And so they started to either open source those technologies, things like Hadoop, or commercialize them uh, and, and charge money for them, maybe as a service. And so here we are in the 2020s where that has grown to such a scale that it is practical for anybody to use massive amounts of computing power and all of that is at our fingertips. Um, and so uh, this is a really exciting time for us that live in the world of data and analytics. 
when we talk about the cloud, I guess we should be very uh, specific about what we're talking about. I kind of made this view facetiously. Um, I think everyone probably knows how to pronounce cloud, but the cloud is more pervasive in our lives than uh, in our personal lives, actually, than it is in our professional ones. So Netflix, Spotify, you know, your Tesla, Google Home, Gmail, Disney Plus, your house you know, doesn't have a Spotify server that, that, that would be impractical. So, you know, we, we use Spotify as a service. That's the cloud at work. When I talk about cloud today, mostly I'm going to be talking about the public cloud on the left-hand side there, but you can think of this as something that could be merged with on-premise resources. We call that the hybrid cloud, or if you're a very, you know, if you're a, uh, an investment bank or something that deals with very sensitive information, you might have you host your own private cloud, but for today, for the most part, um, we're going to be talking about the public cloud. All right, important for us to lay some groundwork here and understand what modern analytics architecture actually looks like. And so uh, what is our goal as data workers? I think we just we don't wanna just build things for the sake of building them. What we wanna do and what we're tasked with is moving data from wherever it lives, getting into the hands of whoever needs it most at the right time in the right format. And this really doesn't look fundamentally different than an on-premise big data architecture with a couple of fundamental changes. So I wanna, we'll throw this as a bit of an analogy here. So we need a couple of capabilities in our design, much like a logistics or a shipping company, okay? Stay with me. So we need to source our product, our data. Uh, so we need a, a method to do real time or scheduled extraction from wherever that data lives. Um, we need distribution. So we need places to drop and organize our newly acquired raw data. So a warehouse, for example, we need packaging, which is the final presentation layer of that data where we take you know, some of that raw data, we package some of it up together from different areas and that becomes one tote, one box that we're gonna ship to whoever needs it. Um, we need shipping. So that's an engine to move the data all the way along this pipeline and we need uh, delivery. So we need an interface for humans or machines to interpret or enrich this data further. Okay. So if we strip away this analogy, what does that look like? Um, it actually looks like this. So a few things I want you to note before I simplify this even more. The way we ingest data. So this new tier of the architecture, it's kind of decoupled from logic uh, or transformations of this data. So really it's intended just to lift data and throw it over the fence into a container, whether in batch or in real time. The way we store data has changed. So in multiple progressive forms of refinement. So, you know, because our use of data is not, we don't just need perfect data sets anymore. Sometimes raw data is very valuable. There's insights in there. and so you know, we're, we're, we're dropping and refining data in a couple of different formats. And then there's a bunch of things to support and enrich that data. But for now, I really wanna focus on the pipeline. And so if you think of it in terms of data ingestion, so I've taken that conceptual diagram and actually made it a little more technical now. So uh, ingestion, where we're extracting and replicating data, ELT or ETL, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. This is where a lot of our transformations happen. So the, where we're imposing business logic on data, our data lake, where we are storing raw data and then refining it along the way, and our data warehouse, which really acts as this analytical uh, computing query engine, serving results to models, uh, uh, results, yeah, to, to a machine learning model or to a consumer, somebody asking for a result set, okay? So really important, take a mental snapshot of this because we're gonna be coming back to it often, okay? Now, things have changed and it's important to understand what has changed uh, over time. One of the biggest concepts, and you probably pulled it out right there, is the concept of a data lake. So, you know, this wasn't a uh, always a separate tier um, in history. It was most often a staging area or a schema within our data warehouse, but, but this has changed. E ELT, because computing is so cheap and storage is so cheap. Uh, we just bring all the data and there's a ton of hype around data lakes. And if you spend any time on LinkedIn or, you know, following some of these technology companies, uh, it's, you know, it's not magic, but it's a very valuable tier if you want to build a robust data pipeline. And if it, what, this is one of my favorite charts ever, if you look at this, it, it's the hype cycle for analytics that Gartner puts out. Um, data lakes are on their own. If you look for them, they're right there. Um, and that's, you know, if you think back to the, the genesis of data lakes, that's about 15 years they've been around. So it took about 15 years to get over that hump uh, of, uh, of uh, 
inflated expectations. What a great name. Uh, and so, you know, now it's, it's uh, onward for data lakes. This is something that is economically viable. The technology is there, the skills are there. And so when we talk about a data lake, it's very un uh, important for us to understand what we're talking about. It is centralized. It stores structured, semi-structured and unstructured data. And that data can be stored as is. We don't need to do anything to it. No transformations needed. It supports Lambda, what we call Lambda architecture. So this is streaming and batch in real time. Uh, it supports massive computing. And so this is also really important for us to understand is that we need to be able to throw, uh, to be able to support massive computing requirements. So if there's a data lake initiative that you've got, please make sure you keep these critical things in mind. ETL, ELT, I'll spend a real quick second here. Historically, we, we move data using what we call ETL. So we extract from the source, then we transform T, that data, and then we load L into a repository. But storage, like I alluded to, is so cheap now that by default, um, not exclusively, but almost always, we extract all the data uh, from wherever it is, and we store it before doing almost anything to it. And this helps us with things like refreshing data or lineage or troubleshooting any transformations that go wrong, uh, retaining historical records and a lot more. So, you know, this is very, this is especially true if any big data parameters start to sneak in things like semi or unstructured data, massive volumes, or if we've got data science applications. Let's talk about uh, how we compute data now. So we've talked about how to lift it and get it from wherever it lives. Let's talk about um, how we compute results. So let's agree on what kind of data we're working with, okay? First and foremost, structured data. Everybody's pretty familiar with structured data. This is anything that can be uh, thought of in rows and columns, okay? So uh, think of it like a table or an Excel spreadsheet. Um, these are transaction financial records. Next up, we've got um, things like text, uh, images, uh, videos. So we'll call this unstructured data, no discernible format. Um, if you were to open this in notepad, it would just look like a bunch of random text. It is pictures and videos and call recordings, emails and documents uh, arguably could be dumped into this bucket as well. We also have to deal with semi-structured data. So this is often human readable. If you did open it, you could probably tell what was going on. You could say, mm, this is like a sensor data. I see a sensor ID. I see a measurement type. Uh, I see the measurement, but it's all kind of nested weird. Um, this is what we call semi-structured data, JSON, XML, etc. Often forgotten, we have metadata. So metadata is data about data, extremely important. This gives any data point its context when we're looking at it, things like properties, who brought it in, where did it come from, etc. And so to handle all of this, we now have to build infrastructure to, it's not, it can't just land in one type of data of database anymore, right? Um, it's actually a little more complicated than that. So, uh, but the cloud makes this uh, amazing. You can spin up any of these containers on demand. And so we're gonna walk through a couple of them here. To start with, uh, relational data. So everybody knows rela relational data. Um, these are based on a very straightforward way of representing data in tables. In a relational database, you know each row in the table is unique. Uh, it has a ID called what we call a key. The columns on the table represent and hold the attributes of the data and each record usually has a value for each attribute. So uh, we can join tables together, etc. What is, well, you know, and th th this is 90% of what we used to work with is data like this, but you can tell by the, the amount of room left on the screen here, we're gonna talk about a lot more. Document stores, these are one of the main categories of what we call NoSQL databases or not only SQL databases. So uh, if you think of somebody like Amazon where you have a lot of different products that don't share many attributes. A piano is very different than a pair of shoes. And so think of trying to get those into the same table. Uh, we use documents instead. Document databases are a, 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 a subclass of a key value store, which we'll talk about um, in a second. So there's the document databases and some examples of those. A graph database. So let's think about graph databases. Um, if you think of something very relationshipy like LinkedIn, uh, their graph database is called Liquid, L-I capitalized for LinkedIn. Um, they're very similar to a document database, but they add another layer, which is a relationship. So that allows us to link documents together for rapid traversal. 
We've got the concept of data warehouses. Uh, and so everybody's familiar with a data warehouse. This is now a specific function inside of uh, the world of data storage where we're doing a lot of massive computing. A time series or a time-stamped database, a historian database. This is measuring events over time. So, you know, server metrics, uh, network data, sensor data, events, clicks, trades in a market, anything like that, that happens uh, very rapidly. Um, we, uh, a time series database is optimized for that. And a key value store. So this is where we're storing, retrieving, managing, um, now to get very data science -y on, or computer science -y on you, but we call these associative arrays. If you wanna Google it, uh, you might think of these as hash tables. So a, a key value store basically is, is we are retrieving records using a key that uniquely identifies a record and we use that to find the data within the database. And so, you know, for this reason, BI tools just alone cannot be the answer for modeling and merging modern data sets together. And so, you know, the last mile is this, you know, building repeatable, auditable workflows that can be published as endpoints uh, to be called or further refined downstream. And this is what we use Alteryx for. Really, really powerful, this last mile. You know, if you think of things like being able to handle all of that data we just talked about, um, you know, something like a JSON file, like you're seeing on the left-hand side there, Alteryx does this uh, just natively. So we select the output format, connect, and it spits out um, a perfect little list of those attributes into what can now be used as a relational data set. Let's talk about some computer science for a second. Trust me, even if you're not technical, this is what makes the cloud so different uh, when it comes to data curation. The abstract of the warehousing mechanics from both input and output. So with traditional databases, if you think of it like a computer just like yours, all the storage and compute were kind of tied together. It was like one machine. Whereas now we've separated storage, so we, that, that container that holds the data, and the computing power, which we keep completely separately as, as worker nodes. Um, why is this so important? Well, look at uh, the example that I'm going to show you in a second, um, where we have a bunch of different people going after the same sort of data. And so all these different workloads, whether they're finance or data scientists or a marketing group, um, can all be using different computing engines and therefore spending different amounts of money, having different horsepower allocated to them. They're completely decoupled from each other. So if the data science team is doing something crazy, it's not going to affect my finance reports on the top. Right, And so this is extremely important. Uh, and now we can control databases. We can say, okay, if you hit a peak time, go ahead and make one, two, three copies of yourself to handle that workload and then shut yourself off again and stop, you know, most importantly, stop running up the bill. And so, you know, these are very, very elastic solutions that allow us to do what we do. Um, where should we go next? I think what I'd like to talk about is, so, is this where we're we're going to put Alteryx now in the context of the pipeline that we talked about earlier. So if we think of it in terms of extraction from sources, this is where we could use Alteryx. Alteryx can connect to almost anything. Um, and so it could be taking data from a website or scraping it off of a web page, uh, taking it from a news feed, pulling new transactions in from uh, a sales database and putting it into a data lake. Alteryx could be used to do those transformations. So a lot of the logic in the middle, which we're going to talk about in a second, could be performed by an Alteryx workflow. Something Somebody has defined that logic and it runs on a schedule. Uh, and so it's taking all that data, pivoting it, cleaning out nulls and putting it into our data warehouse. It could also be used to package up data for that last mile. So let's say we want to add some spatial analytics to it. Our data only tells us where a customer is shopping. We could use Alteryx after the data warehouse to draw a trade area and say, well, this is kind of this, where, where we should be marketing to uh, consumers who have this type of behavior. And then obviously, you know, our data scientists are going to be using Alteryx to do a lot of advanced analytics, uh, building machine learning models. They could use Alteryx then to deploy that back to our data lake. Let's make predictions and push it back into our data lake so that others can use those predictions too and understand those patterns. 
Um, it's really important to understand that this is our business rules engine. This decouples us from the logic layers and that's where we're gonna go next. So really, really important to understand how modeling happens. So now we've talked about the data pipeline. We've talked about how data is stored and computed. Now we're gonna talk about how to, how to impose business rules. And I think if you're used to doing traditional uh, BI, this was pretty straightforward. Usually we had a little star schema built for us by our data warehouse team um, and our dimensions and facts from there pretty directly translated to this layer. Now it's a little fuzzier, right? Where does computing happen? So um, I think it, you, what's mo what you wanna take away here mostly is that uh, we wanna push down some of these operations back to the data warehouse because these are very compute intense activities we're doing, joining things, uh, applying very complex business rules, we're applying security. And so um, we're often handling that mostly in what we call a semantic layer. Now there's a very big risk to doing that. Uh, and we, you know, we consistently have a whole pile of projects uh, active at Newcomb where we are cleaning this up because, uh, you know, embedding business rules into a layer inherently ties you to that technology, right? And so what we're trying to do with Alteryx and what clients are doing is pulling that logic backwards and saying, instead of living in Tableau, Power BI, Cognos, MicroStrategy, whatever your BI tool is, pull that business logic back a layer and manage it all in one place. What does that allow us to do? Well, for sure it allows us to govern that a little bit more. So if we're going to change a calculation, like you see on the left-hand side there, um, you can see all the downstream risks. So if I'm changing some logic, this allows us to catalog, track lineage, understand if we're gonna change a business rule, who should be notified. Um, now that's all kind of centrally managed in one place. And so your architecture ends up looking much more like this, where we've got all these data sources that we just talked about, they're being sewn together into uh, the database or data storage layer that's most appropriate for them. The workflow and the business logic is being captured in the Alteryx platform. And then, you know, your Power BI, uh, Tableau, your data scientists using Jupyter Notebooks, um, they're the ones consuming it after that. Remember in the diagram, um, those analytic applications at the end there. So what's most important is that we want to capture those workflows that are where that, those business rules are being applied, where some sort of spatial analytics are being done, a forecast being generated. And we want to turn that into a little product, something that we can automate and publish. And so, uh, you know, this is why Alteryx is so amazing because we can take those models and make them reproducible. So it's something that's not abstracted from everybody. You can see here it sits in a gallery and you say, I wanna predict which students are going to drop out. And that uses the same model every single time. Now, this is a lot of change and change management is critical to this. So let's talk a little bit about skills for a second. Almost every role is going to change, especially if you shift to more of an agile methodology, which goes hand in hand with the cloud. A more DevOps type approach means that you're constantly building, supporting, uh, designing, refining all your analytical assets. And so training will need to happen. It's going to be uncomfortable, um, but where we see the most success is starting with those who have the biggest skills gap. And this is most often the IT infrastructure people, and they may feel threatened by the cloud. The cloud and the tools on the cloud are constantly under change. And so, um, you know, new features are being rolled out daily. You'll see a new button appear or whatever. So I want you to really think about how you structure user training. It's really, really important. And what we've done is kind of, you know, here's a, this is an example mapping of jobs and skills that you're seeing right now. We captured a few of these um, from some of our last projects. And so you're welcome to steal some of these ideas, but this is, this is the transitions that we are seeing. Somebody who was a solution architect can be trained and pivot to a cloud architect. Somebody who is an ETL developer, you know, that almost very naturally transitions to something like a data engineer. And so, you know, if you can build a successful pipeline, source data properly, um, make sure that it gets into the hands of those who need it most, it's governed, it's secured, uh, you've got this really modern cloud infrastructure that you can use to go to the next level. Now you can move on to things like data science. Uh, now you can build very complex models. Now you can do the kinds of forecasts that your users have always asked you to do, and you're well on your way. So thank you very much for joining us today. Really appreciate it, and we'll chat soon.